It is commonly said by anthropologists that primitive man is less individual and more completely molded by his society than civilized man. This contains an element of truth. Simpler societies are more uniform, in the sense that they call for, and provide opportunities for, a far smaller diversity of individual skills and occupations than the more complex and advanced societies. Increasing individualization in this sense is a necessary product of modern advanced society, and runs through all its activities from top to bottom. But it would be a serious error to set up an antithesis between this process of individualization and the growing strength and cohesion of society. Team Labs Digital Mural at the entrance to Tokyo Skytree, one of the world's monster skyscrapers, is 40 meters long and immensely detailed. But however, massive this form of digital art becomes and it's a form subject to rampant inflation, Inako's theories about seeing are based on more modest and often pre-digital sources. An early devotee of comic books and cartoons, no surprises there, then computer games. He recognized when he started to look at traditional Japanese art that all those forms had something in common, something about the way they captured space. In his discipline of physics, Inako had been taught that photographic lenses, along with the conventions of Western art were the logical way of transforming three dimensions into two, conveying the real world onto a flat surface. But Japanese traditions employed a different spatial logic, as he said in an interview last year with jcollabo.org, that is uniquely Japanese. Exposure to gun violence makes adolescents twice as likely to perpetrate serious violence in the next two years, according to a University of Michigan study. Researchers found there is a substantial cause and effect relationship between exposure and perpetration of violence. Jeffrey B. Bingenheimer, a doctoral student in health behavior and health education, analyzed five years of data from adolescents living in 78 neighborhoods in Chicago. Bingenheimer is lead author on a paper in this week's journal Science. Crime prevention has a long history in Australia, and in other parts of the world. In all societies, people have tried to protect themselves and those close to them from assaults and other abuses. Every time someone locks the door to their house or their car, they practice a form of prevention. Most parents want their children to learn to be law-abiding and not spend extended periods of their lives in prison. In this country, at least, most succeed. Only a small minority of young people become recidivist offenders. In a functioning society, crime prevention is part of everyday life. While prevention can be all pervasive at the grassroots, it is oddly neglected in mass media and political discourses. When politicians, talkback radio hosts and newspaper editorialists pontificate about crime and possible remedies, it is comparatively rare for them to mention prevention. Overwhelmingly, emphasis is on policing, sentencing and other law and order responses.
Many people today think of culture in the way that it was thought of in Europe during the 18th and early 19th centuries. This concept of culture reflected inequalities within European societies and their colonies around the world. This understanding of culture equates culture with civilization and contrasts both with nature or non-civilization. According to this understanding of culture, some countries are more civilized than others, and some people are more cultured than others. Anything that doesn't fit into this category is labeled as chaos or anarchy. From this perspective, culture is closely tied to cultivation, which is the progressive refinement of human behavior. In practice, culture referred to elite goods and activities such as haute cuisine, high fashion or haute culture, museum caliber art and classical music. The word cultured referred to people who knew about and took part in these activities. For example, Someone who used culture in this sense might argue that classical music is more refined than music by working class people, such as jazz or the indigenous music traditions of aboriginal peoples. Agrarian parties are political parties chiefly representing the interests of peasants or, more broadly, the rural sector of society. The extent to which they are important, or whether they even exist, depends mainly on two factors. One, obviously, is the size of an identifiable peasantry, or the size of the rural relative to the urban population. The other is the matter of social integration, for agrarian parties to be important. The representation of countryside or peasantry must not be integrated with the other major sections of society. Thus, a country might possess a sizable rural population, but have an economic system in which the interests of the voters were predominantly related to their incomes, rather than their occupations or location, and in such a country the political system would be unlikely to include an important agrarian party. Once an organization has its product to sell, it must then determine the appropriate price to sell it at. The price is set by balancing many factors including supply and demand, cost, desired profit competition, perceived value, and market behavior. Ultimately, the final price is determined by what the market is willing to exchange for the product. Pricing theory can be quite complex because so many factors influence what the purchaser decides is a fair value. Children who skip school are increasingly on family holidays, government figures reveal today fewer children play truant this spring term compared with the spring term last year. Children missed 3 meters unauthorized days of school last term, compared with 3.7 meters days of school in the same period last year. But a hardcore group of truants 6% of the school population, who account for more than 3 quarters of all those on unauthorized absence are more likely to be on a family holiday than they were in the same period last year. Some 1.2% of all absence was for family holidays not agreed by their school last term, compared with 0.9% for the same term last year. More than 60% of all absences were for illness, the same figure as last year.
During the day, the sun heats up both the ocean surface and the land water is a good absorber of the energy from the sun. The land absorbs much of the sun's energy as well. However, water heats up much more slowly than land and so the air above the land will be warmer compared to the air over the ocean. The warm air over the land will arise throughout the day, causing low pressure at the surface. Over the water, high surface pressure will form because of the colder air. To compensate, the air will sink over the ocean. The wind will blow from the high pressure over the water to lower pressure over the land causing the sea breeze. The sea breeze strength will vary depending on the temperature difference between the land and the ocean. Steven Pinker, a cognitive psychologist best known for his book The Language Instinct, has called music auditory cheesecake, an exquisite confection crafted to tick all the sensitive spots of at least six of our mental faculties, if it vanished from our species, he said, the rest of our lifestyle would be virtually unchanged, others have argued that, on the contrary, music, along with art and literature, is part of what makes people human, its absence would have a brutalizing effect. Philip Ball, a British science writer and an avid music enthusiast, comes down somewhere in the middle. He says that music is ingrained in our auditory, cognitive and motor functions. We have a music instinct as much as a language instinct, and could not rid ourselves of it if we tried. Australia and New Zealand have many common links. Both countries were recently settled by Europeans, are predominantly English-speaking and in that sense, share a common cultural heritage. Although in close proximity to one another, both countries are geographically isolated and have small populations by world standards. They have similar histories and enjoy close relations on many fronts. In terms of population characteristics, Australia and New Zealand have much in common. Both countries have minority indigenous populations, and during the latter half of the 20th century have seen a steady stream of migrants from a variety of regions throughout the world. Both countries have experienced similar declines in fertility since the high levels recorded during the baby boom, and alongside this have enjoyed the benefits of continually improving life expectancy. One consequence of these trends is that both countries are faced with an aging population, and the associated challenge of providing appropriate care and support for this growing group within the community. Down the road, the study authors write, a better understanding of sharks' personalities may help scientists learn more about what drives their choice of things like prey and habitat. Some sharks are shy, and some are outgoing, some are adventurous, and some prefer to stick close to what they know, information that could prove useful in making sense of larger species-wide behavior patterns. Sustainable job growth is a motto for many governments, especially in the aftermath of a recession. The problem of job quality is less often addressed and may be seen as hindering job growth. The sentiment any job is better than no job may resonate with governments as well as people, 
especially in the context of high unemployment. However, if the balance between improving the quality of existing jobs and creating new jobs becomes greatly imbalanced towards the latter, this could increase work stress among current and future workers, which in turn has health, economic and social costs. A recent British Academy Policy Center report on stress at work highlights these concerns, and describes the context, determinants and consequences of work-related stress in Britain. The first banks were probably the religious temples of the ancient world, and were probably established sometime during the 3rd millennium BC. Banks probably predated the invention of money. Deposits initially consisted of grain and later other goods including cattle, agricultural implements, and eventually precious metals such as gold, in the form of easy-to-carry compressed plates. Temples and palaces were the safest places to store gold as they were constantly attended and well-built. As sacred places, Temples presented an extra deterrent to would-be thieves. Two decades ago, Kashmiri houseboat owners rubbed their hands every spring at the prospect of the annual influx of tourists. From May to October, the hyacinth choked waters of Dale Lake saw flotillas of vividly painted shikaris carrying Indian families, boho westerners, young travelers and wide-eyed Japanese. Carpet sellers owned their skills, as did purveyors of anything remotely embroidered while the houseboats initiated by the British Raj provided unusual accommodation. Then, in 1989, separatist and Islamist militancy attacked and everything changed. Hindus and countless Kashmiri business people bolted, at least 35,000 people were killed in a decade, the lake stagnated, and the houseboats rotted. Any foreigners venturing there risked their lives, proved in 1995 when five young Europeans were kidnapped and murdered. Almost all public spaces nowadays have advertisements in sight, and all forms of media, from newspapers to the cinema to the internet, are filled with adverts. This all-pervasive presence reflects the value of advertising to us. Without it, businesses of all types and sizes would struggle to inform potential customers about the products or services they provide, and consumers would be unable to make informed assessments when looking for products to buy and services to use. Without advertising, the promotion of products and practices that contribute to our physical and psychological well-being medicines to treat minor ailments, insurance schemes to protect us, clothes and cosmetics to make us look and feel better would be infinitely more problematic than it is. And without advertisements and the aspirations represented in them, the world would be a far duller place. One of the most eminent of psychologists, Clark Hull, 
claimed that the essence of reasoning lies in the putting together of two behavior segments in some novel way, never actually performed before, so as to reach a goal. Two followers of Clark Hull, Howard and Tracy Gendler, devised a test for children that was explicitly based on Clark Hull's principles. The children were given the task of learning to operate a machine so as to get a toy. In order to succeed they had to go through a two-stage sequence. Your teenage daughter gets top marks in school, captains the debate team, and volunteers at a shelter for homeless people. But while driving the family car, she text messages her best friend and rear-ends another vehicle. How can teens be so clever, accomplished, and responsible and reckless at the same time? Easily, according to two physicians at Children's Hospital Boston and Harvard Medical School, HMS, who have been exploring the unique structure and chemistry of the adolescent brain. The teenage brain is not just an adult brain with fewer miles on it, says Francis E. Jensen, a professor of neurology. It's a paradoxical time of development. These are people with very sharp brains, but they are not quite sure what to do with them. Volcanoes blast more than 100 million tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere every year but the gas is usually harmless. When a volcano erupts, carbon dioxide spreads out into the atmosphere and isn't concentrated in one spot. But sometimes the gas gets trapped underground under enormous pressure. If it escapes to the surface in a dense cloud, it can push out oxygen richer and become deadly cloud, focused, concentrated, dangerous, harmful atmosphere. Fortunately, educators have access to many online resources that are especially useful when helping children along the path to peace. The Young Peacemakers Club, started in 1992, provides a website with resources for teachers and information on starting a kindness campaign. Their World Centers of Compassion for Children International call attention to children's rights and how to help the victims of war. Starting a peacemakers club is a praiseworthy adventure for a class and one that could spread to other classrooms and ideally affect the culture of the entire school. There's no question that the Earth is getting hotter. The real questions are, how much of the warming is a fault, and are we willing to slow the devastation by controlling our insatiable appetite for fossil fuels? Global warming can seem too remote to worry about, or too uncertain something projected by the same computer techniques that often can't get next week's weather right. On a raw winter day you might think that a few degrees of warming wouldn't be such a bad thing anyway. And no doubt about it. Warnings about climate change can sound like an environmentalist scare tactic, meant to force us out of our cars and restrict our lifestyles.
Perhaps it should come as no surprise then that food has been a medium for the nation's defining struggles, whether at the Boston Tea Party or the sit-ins at southern lunch counters. It is integral to our concepts of health and even morality whether one refrains from alcohol for religious reasons or evades meat for political ideals. But strong opinions have not brought certainty. Americans are ambivalent about what they put in their mouths. We have become suspicious of our foods, especially as we learn more about what they contain. The ritual of food is still prosperous in the American consciousness. It's no coincidence, then, that the first Thanksgiving holds the American imagination in such bondage. It's what we eat, and how we share it with friends, family, and strangers, that help define America as a community today. There are two basic branches of the science of astronomy, observational and theoretical. Observational astronomy, as the name suggests, is concerned with observing the skies and then analyzing the observations, using the principles of physics. Theoretical astronomy focuses more on developing computer or analytical models to describe astronomical phenomena. The two fields complement each other, with observational astronomers attempting to confirm theoretical results and theoreticians aiming to explain what has been observed. You may think that the World Cup, like the Olympic Games, only occurs once every four years. It is the final rounds that take place every four years, but the competition as a whole is an ongoing event, since the qualifying rounds take place over the preceding three years. The final phase of the tournament now involves 32 teams competing over a four-week period in a previously nominated host nation. It has become the most widely viewed sporting event in the world. The majority of early pictures in the National Portrait Gallery's care are by unknown artists, with fundamental questions, such as when, where and why they were painted still remaining to be answered. Through the application of scientific methods, a new project has the potential to unlock evidence that will allow researchers to determine answers to these questions. They will use a combination of cutting-edge scientific techniques, such as X-ray and infrared reflectography in order to reveal new information about individual paintings.